Our Father in heaven, it is true what we have just sung. We know that the glories of knowing Christ and especially the glories of being with Christ, our oh Father, it's worth more than seven troubles that lie in between here and him. Father, it's, he's worth a thousand troubles. <clears throat> we pray this day as we consider Christ again that we'd be filled with a great sense of his worth and of, our, and of his love for us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this is our Lord Jesus speaking, John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Last session we considered the dignity and hope of Christian women. Let me briefly elaborate what we looked at. We considered her original dignity. She was made from the man. God took, took Adam's substance and created Eve, but with adjustments to make her not only comparable but complementary to him. Two parts making a whole capable of knowing intimacy and fellowship, able to function as the prime unit in society. So she shares man's dignity. She was also made in the image of God. God gave to men and women attributes that make him them like himself. And Christ himself communicated to her her reasoning powers and moral awareness. She shares the same original dignity as men. They are not inferior intellectually, emotionally or spiritually. We also considered her subsequent sufferings. When sin came into the world, the relationship between men and women changed. God punished both the man and the woman according to the different roles they played in bringing sin into the world. God determined that the wife would be ruled by the husband. But men in their sin have misused this situation. Men have often subjugated women for selfish ends, treated as though they were merely for his use. And that's almost been universal throughout the world. Even the godly fail to honour their wives and daughters as they should have. But then we considered lastly her great blessedness under Christ. Christ has come into the world to correct abuses. He demands that his disciples turn away from attitude that God never intended. In Christ they share the same status and privileges with men. And they also look forward to the same inheritance and glory with men. The relationship between the sexes, which is useful for now, will one day change forever. Old structures put in place only for this life away. The new age, the new kingdom will be one of privilege, glory, joy and fellowship with God and each other. You know, we can hardly conceive of what that means. All we know is that every vestige of sin and every sorrow resulting from sin will be taken away and all redeemed humans move into the next stage of humanity that God has planned for us, that Christ has planned for us. <clears throat> so the woman is not a lower caste in Christ's kingdom. She has great expectations and in the light of those great expectations she must make great preparations. And I want to consider three things under that title, great preparations. The first is this, if all these things are hers in Christ, if all these things are waiting for her through Christ, then let her study Christ eagerly. Let her study zealously because he is her creator. He formed her person, not just her frame, but her awareness, her reasoning, her mind. Christ is the one who upholds her present life. Every breath she takes is from Christ and he is the one who is redeeming her. She was in his mind. He saw face when he endured the cross. It was her sins he was bearing and he is currently in, the, in heaven now at the right hand of God, occupied with her protection and with her progress. He's preparing a place for her. His kingdom, which is finally going to sweep in very soon, is for her that she might be with him and witness his glory. So he made her and is redeeming her so that she might be with him. He is the cause of her existence and the goal of her existence. And the greatest obligation for a believing woman is to know Jesus Christ. This is why he gave her her reasoning powers. In fact, this is why he has 
renewed her reasoning powers. In regeneration, he's taken away that old sinful reasoning. He's taken a prison of sin that a mind is in that she might understand who he is. And so Peter calls women as well as men to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. She must set out with great deliberation to inform herself about the Lord, who he is, what his salvation, what his worldview is, what his will is. But there are a number of reasons why women can fail to do this. Most of them are through misunderstandings. (coughs) Some conclude that such learning is not for them. They may read in scripture that a woman is not to have authority over a man in a church setting and conclude that doctrinal knowledge is not really the realm of the woman. Her role is just to have the right emotions and the right feelings and the right responses to truth when she hears it. That's all she's to do. But doctrine, precise understanding, exhaustive breath of the knowledge of God and the knowledge of Christ, that's to be left to men. That's their realm. Friends, that's just not the case. Christ has equipped women with reasoning powers and in salvation has renewed those reasoning powers that might understand and know him. And God calls all to love him supremely with our whole being and that includes our heart, soul, mind and strength. Some feeling but knowing that they do have intellectual powers are prepared to be preoccupied with other things. Many young women are finding themselves in university or business that requires serious study and mental exertion. They will give their mind to these things, to their schooling or running the firm, but doctrinal knowledge, it's not really for them. In the same way that it's for men. That's wrong. They may be fearful. If they strive to build up a body of knowledge about the things of God, it may lead to trouble with their church or or her husband may feel threatened. That's possible. In this last year, I've had to counsel a woman whose husband wants her to leave. One of the reasons is it's clear that that he's embittered against her. He felt he had profound understanding of the things of God and wrote a book. He had had it printed at his own cost, 3,000 copies. He took it to pastors and bookshops. No one's interested. But his wife is leaping ahead in understanding of and he's embittered against her. The trouble lies with him, not her. Some ladies might dismiss themselves from serious learning because they do not have aptitude like others do. And I often mean by that, well, men have aptitude, women don't. The reality is men as well as women vary in aptitude. Let me tell you, as a pastor, I know that men, as well as women, vary greatly in aptitude. But would we ever consent to a pastor saying to the men of the congregation, listen, those of you who have aptitude, who have aptitude, need to study the things of God. We wouldn't tolerate that. No, we would emphasise that God expects us all to use what we have to the best of our ability. Some are given one talent, some are given five and some ten. Let each do their best in using the mind that's given them to grow in his grace and knowledge. It's amazing, by the way, how much the mind is expanded as we give ourselves to researching and exploring, especially the things of God. Oftentimes it's not a lack of aptitude, it's indifference. Often there is a little purpose. And many women find themselves happy in a routine that does not demand too much thinking of them. As they go about their daily routine, and let's be honest, ladies, sometimes it does get very mundane. As they go about their daily routine of schooling, drying, cooking, organising all the little things that make up domestic life, while they're doing it, they flick on the radio, they listen to their favourite shows, their talk back or their music. We have the most music saturated society that's ever been. And when they finish their routine, they just want to sit down and relax with their favourite magazine or just go. It might be completely inoffensive. But they've settled in to routine. 
and a routine that doesn't involve serious reflection and thought and study and research. Life indeed can get very busy for all of us, but we need to be ready to use all the means that God has given us for the purpose of knowing him, for the purpose of knowing Christ. So ladies, learn of Christ. Study Christ. Especially give attention to hearing the word of God. This is the prime means of grace. Give attention to reading and don't give yourself the doctrinal reading. It's funny how women will go into a major Christian bookstore and sort through all what I would call the peripheral stuff. But you'll never find them in the theology section. I think that's a mindset. Give yourself not just to devotional reading but doctrinal reading. Build systematic understanding. Be inquisitive. Ask questions because Christ allows you and Christ expects it of you. Buy a sketchbook. Buy an A5 sketchbook. Begin to lay out specific truths. Break them down into their different parts. Draw lines of connection so that you can see how one truth on another or affects another truth or is built upon another truth because you are able. Christ has given you a reasonable mind and has renewed your mind. Do you know how many use a catechism? Possibly in the churches or privately? Use a catechism. Catechisms are the result of years of careful study of the Word of God. The truths of God's Word are, are carefully compressed and summarised into wonderful little statements. I have to say that my favourite is this. The only redeemer of God's elect. The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ who being the eternal Son of God became man and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures. Yet, ransom forever. Do you realise how many amazing truths are compressed into that little statement? And these little statements actually not only, not only are learned easily, but they, they stir up a great deal of inquisitiveness. They whet the appetite. Use all the means at your disposal, and there are some great means. Remember to study Christ in particular. Study his being, his nature. Study what he is. That he is literally the eternal God, the eternal Son, who has now taken on the same nature as you and I, so he really genuinely is a king with all the sympathies and experiences of what it is to be a human being. And so he, as God, can yet feel the difficulties we are going through. Study his cross, study the atonement, that is his payment, because his dying opens up the floodgates of God's blessing for you. His bearing your guilt takes away every hindrance to God completely and utterly embracing you and blessing you. Study his character. Study his goodwill, his unwavering goodwill towards sinners. See how he lives. See how he endures difficulties. He obeys under trial. And study his will. He wants you to walk how he wants you to walk in the different departments of life, how he wants you to respond under different trials. And ladies, learn of Christ for three good reasons. First of all, learn of Christ for his own sake. Learn of Christ for his own sake because he deserves your worship. He deserves your mental preoccupation. He deserves your reflecting upon him out on the back veranda when your duties are over. No one can understand, no one can come to understand who Jesus is and fail to worship him. So learn of Christ for his own sake because he deserves your glory. Secondly, learn of Christ for yourself. There's a genuine grasp of Christ that will utterly liberate you. A true knowledge of Christ delivers from every fear, the fear of dying. That king of terrors when you understand how much Christ's death has liberated God to completely love you, you can't fear death. A true knowledge of Christ, fear of the future. A true knowledge of Christ delivers from the fear of others. 
A true knowledge of Christ releases us from our selfishness and our ego because no one can look upon the Lord and watch him at work and come away feeling they have a right to a carefree and pleasurable life. A true knowledge of Christ will release you from discontent, from envy and from covetousness because you will realise that the Son of God is Lord over all your circumstances and in wisdom has laid out your life. Friends, us, true knowledge of Christ, learning of Christ will cure you of resentment. When you see him upon the cross, looking upon those men who beat him, whipped him, slapped him and took away all his dignity and say, Father, forgive them. You will learn how to deal with resentment. Learning of Christ will liberate you. And ladies, learn of Christ for the same men may not have all the same avenues as women to teach. But the knowledge and instruction of women has been essential in making the church strong. It's clear that Timothy received instruction from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They played a pivotal, a pivotal role <coughs> excuse me, in forming the framework of his understanding. They taught him scripture and they taught him from scripture. We know that it was then because Timothy's father was a Greek and was unconverted that he did not have the slightest care how his son's mind was shaped, whether we had a godly outlook or not. And this is a great encouragement. God is off to use women and to use mothers to instruct children, to build them up in their most holy faith. You know, Spurgeon publicly expressed his gratitude to Mary King. She was an elderly cook at the school in Newmarket, which he attended. In her kitchen, she taught him many of the deep things of God, many doubts about the things of God, that were in his mind as a child. From her he received, he said, his first lessons in theology. He said, many a time we have gone over the covenant of grace together. She was an exceptional woman. She lived strongly as well as thinly. He said he learned more from her than from the minister of the chapel which he attended. In Acts 18 we read of Apollos, an Alexandrian Jew, now, he was already an earnest and eloquent preacher, a powerful preacher. The thing was, he was limited in his information. And Luke tells us that when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Priscilla, with her husband Aquila, sharpened his grasp of the gospel. In fact, the way the wording is often with Priscilla and Aquila, she sometimes comes first. She was a profound Christian. They sharpened his grasp of the gospel. They completed the puzzle for him. They filled in a great deal which was lacking. And women have often greatly been helped by the insights of other women. You know, wise men do grasp of the responsibilities and trials particular to women. There are many pastors sensitive to the different situations of their people. But there are also lots of occasions when the thing most needed (coughs) is someone who is also in the midst of it. Someone who has herself made hold of the truths needful and pertinent to that particular situation and that's a tremendous encouragement to have another woman come along and help her sister in those issues. That's the first thing I would plead with you. Learn of Christ. Give your into energies and powers to learning of You know, I just hate to this this kind of new phrase, you know, it's not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. I hate that phrase. I know what they mean by it. But it suggests that somehow you don't need to give yourself energetically to understanding and grasping. And I would urge you to do so. My second point is this. Let the Christian woman serve Christ passionately. One of the wonderful things about the New Testament is how much coverage, media coverage, if you almost say, gives of women's service and devotion to Christ. We have Mary and Martha, single ladies, who did such a great deal to help the Lord in his ministry and not only refreshed him as a friend and a human being, they had their home available for him to teach. Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna provided for the Lord our substance, the scripture says, so that he might preach and minister. 
other ladies helped as well. Certain women, including Mary, Mary Magdalene, were incredibly courageous in identifying themselves with the Lord during that dangerous time of his suffering. Watching on as he was crucified, they then went and brought expensive perfumes and spices to embalm his body. The same service to Christ continued when women aided the apostles in spreading the news of of Christ. So many women played extensive roles in providing hospitality, houses for worship, Euodia and Syntyche laboured with Paul, probably teaching in settings where it was inappropriate for Paul to do so. Not just providing a glass of water before he preached. Paul refers to Phoebe as a servant of the church in Pancrea. He describes her as a helper of many and of self also. Many women in the Apostles' day had proved to be greatly devoted servants of Christ and often that service was expressed in domestic situations, mothering, serving, caring and that service was rejoiced in by God and is rejoiced in by God today. It's very pleasing service and no Christian wife or mother should ever think they are locked out of serving because they are bound in a domestic situation. They may serve him and bring him great glory in the domestic realm as well as playing roles in the church. But I want you to note this. Quoted before from 1 Corinthians 7. All serving Christ in in the domestic realm is essential to Christ's kingdom. It is not the only kind of service available. There is another kind of service extremely valuable to Christ. The service of the single person. Mothers and wives, fathers and husbands have God gifts abilities which mean they often cannot respond quickly and freely to opportunities for service outside the home. In other words, domestic life restricts their immediate service to needs as they arise. And Paul puts it to the Corinthians, and he does it very carefully and sensitively, but he puts it to the Corinthians and said whether any of them were capable of such a service like he was giving unto the Lord. Both men and women. In fact, he wished all were in his situation but he was looking for people to consider whether or not they might not keep that special flexibility for service that unmarried allowed. To him it was preferable. By the way, preferable does not mean more acceptable. Now the difference there? Those who serve in a domestic realm, their service is just acceptable and embraced by God as a single person. But he's saying the kingdom of God needs extra flexibility. Women, your service is valued by Christ the same as a man's. And you must consider in what way you can serve him the best. Many of you, of course, are already married. Paul's advice is, hey, stay in that situation. Enjoy it. Use it. But remember, be a servant of Christ. But for Paul, being single was not a tragedy. It was an opportunity. And by the way, even more, being widowed was not very grievous, but not a tragedy. It was opportunity to serve the Lord. I just wonder, we don't hear of this very often, this appeal to consider whether singleness might be something that you can take advantage of, that God may have actually given you enough strength and graces to live that single. And I wonder if it's because of Roman Catholicism's nunneries. They've taken some of these scriptures as, as proof texts and they've certainly taken those proof texts and used them in a way that God never intended. But we must not let, let misuse of texts and truths take away from a proper use of texts and truths. But we emphasise, whatever your situation, consider how you might serve Christ passionately because he deserves not only your worship but your service. Lastly, let her submit to Christ patiently. You know, my purpose in these sermons is not to give an exhaustive analysis of the place and role women have in God's purposes. I pretty much confine myself to presenting who she really is in Christ and what Christ has waiting for her. She shares the same privileges and the same blessed future as men. My aim is in doing courage, a great desire to really know Christ 
learn of him and serve him and from the heart look forward to his coming. Be able to say from the heart, even so, come Lord Jesus. But we cannot get away from an issue that makes its presence felt every time such matters are presented. It's kind of like the elephant in the room. That's the woman's role in the public gathering of the church. If she has the same status as men, and if she has the same privileges of men, and if she often has the same aptitude and ability as men, surely she should be granted access to all the same opportunities for ministry as men. And throughout history, churches have traditionally practiced restrictions when it comes to women in the public assembly, when it comes to the corporate gathering of the church for instruction of worship, women ought not to exercise leadership, they ought not to be involved in public preaching and teaching. And they've drawn those restrictions from scripture. Today, in many churches, those restrictions are no longer considered to be required of God. Some of these churches reject them because they no longer see the Bible as reliable. Scripture is not really inspired to the to the degree that people once thought they say. It's not God's word in an absolute sense that it carries authority in every era. It was written by men who were limited, limited in their understanding of the world, very much affected by the ideas that prevailed in their particular culture and society. And so when it comes to ministry, these churches have opened up every avenue of ministry to women that's available to men. Why? Well, it's obvious. Firstly, the Genesis record, the creation record, is based on ancient myths. Therefore, its record of the creation of men and women is just a story. It's got no bearing in the way men and women should relate to each other now. Secondly, the New Testament writers lived in a patriarchal society, a society where women were not esteemed. Women played a decorative role, a servant role, a servant role but they were by no means equal. And the New Testament writers were trapped in this thinking when they wrote down these restrictions. We call such churches churches because of the way they regard scripture. Some do believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, but they look at portions in the New Testament that speak of women exercising public ministries like prophesying. And they regard these passages as giving women freedom to instruct in the church. God is not contradictory. All other passages that seem to restrict them must be, must be interpreted as specific only to that special situation or the trouble of that particular church at the time. That's the position of most charismatic churches today. You know, we all need to be really careful in applying traditions to passages that seem to conflict. However, there is one passage from Paul that is very clear in its restrictions. And the reasons for those restrictions remain binding today. That passage is 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 and 13. The setting is the corporate gathering of God's people. I'd also encourage you again, if you have any questions about what I'm going to deliver in this morning or nearly this afternoon, uh, feel free to, to speak to me afterwards. This is 1 Timothy verses 2, verses 12 and 13. The setting is the corporate gathering of God's people. Paul writes, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over but to be in silence. For, here are the reasons, Adam was formed first, then Eve. And it was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Note a couple of things first off. Consider firstly that Paul regards teaching in a congregate setting as an expression of authority. Preaching and teaching in the congregation are never just acts of explaining, but of directing and commanding in Christ's name. In fact, Peter commands those who teach in the church to teach as the very oracles of God, that is with God's authority, because the gathered church is God's house where his kingly rule over us is expressed. So all preaching and teaching in a congregational setting is an expression of authority. Secondly, consider the word silence. A woman must learn in silence. She must not teach but be in silence. Silence in English is absence of noise. 
not even whispers. Now I'm a father, I have four little children ranging from, well not that little, 14 down to 5. Sometimes my table gets very busy and very noisy as everyone's telling their particular stories of what happened today and some are trying to joke and tell stories and you reach a point where you say, enough! Silence! Not a word! For the next five minutes or until you've finished tea. Sometimes they last the distance. So silence in English means a complete absence of noise. The word translated silence here in the original is husekia and it denotes quietness. It carries the idea of being calm, unflustered. In the context of our passage here, it carries the idea that a woman should eagerly listen without being agitated or combative. The adjective of the same word is used in verse 2 of the same chapter where Paul says that prayer is for kings and leaders that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Not a silent and peaceable life. In 1 Peter 3, 4, the same word is associated with meekness. Paul called wives to have a gentle and a quiet spirit, non-combative. So Paul's concern is not absence of noise, but having a right attitude in this public setting. He's not saying that it's offensive for a woman's voice to be heard in church. Her voice doesn't contaminate the air. If that's the case, she shouldn't be singing the hymns. It's offensive for her to cause a ruckus, ask questions, to be ready to contradict and be combative. That's what Paul's getting at. In a nutshell, she should be eager to be instructed and not teach, eager to take in and not disrupt. That's what he's getting at. You know, in one respect, this is true of us all. Meekness is required of all people, particularly in a, a church setting. James calls us all to be swift to hear slow to speak, slow to wrath. In fact, we can hardly learn without that being the case. But it's especially pertinent to a woman in a church setting that includes men. And Paul gives two reasons why it's especially pertinent to women, both drawn from the beginning of the human race. The first reason has nothing to do with sin. He says Adam was formed first, then Eve. So from Genesis we learn that God made the man first and then made the woman for him to be his assistant, to be his helper, his companion, but not to be his leader. And that difference between men and women, that order is to be observed in a church setting, in every culture and in every age. The second reason is connected with sin. He goes on to say, Adam was not deceived, but the woman deceived fell into transgression. What is he getting at? Is Paul saying that women shouldn't teach because they are more easily led astray, more easily confused than men, more naive than men? Is he saying that Eve proves it? Many think so. I think they're reformed commentators. One writer says, speaking of women, being more easily deceived, she more easily deceives. In other words, women soak up falsehoods more easily than men and lead men astray and others astray. Another writer who holds exactly the same interpretation goes on to say, it is, however, a woman's privilege to teach children and younger women. Now, I have a great problem with this. You see the problem? If women are more easily deceived and therefore and easily deceived, let's allow them to instruct the children the impressionable and the unstable. If, they are so, and if, if these women are unstable, then let them not teach men, let them also instruct the other naive ones. I have a great problem with that interpretation. What does Paul What he means is not explicit in the text, it's implicit in the text. In other words, he expects his readers to know the Genesis story, the creation story. He knows them to, he expects them to know Genesis 1, 2 and 3 very well. He makes the point that while Eve believed, Adam was not. How then did he end up disobeying? It was because she persuaded him. God says to Adam, because you heeded the voice of your wife. Curse is the ground for, for your sake. Her sin was not just eating the forbidden fruit, sin was persuading him to do it. 
the great representative of all mankind. Her sin was not just eating the fruit, but managing him into it. His sin was hitting the voice of his wife and God lays judgment on them both according to the parts they played. Judgment passed on to their respective offspring. What was the judgment passed on Adam? The ground would no longer yield its fruit. It would be hard to make a living and that judgment fell on all the male offspring. Why is it hard for me to make a living? And I do find it hard. We have to count our pennies because of Adam. The judgment that fell on him passes on to his male posterity. That's why men and women have to eke out a living. What was the judgment passed on to women? For managing the man into sin, she would have pain in childbirth and her husband would rule over her. The man would rule the woman and both these judgments fell on their female offspring. Childbirth is extremely painful. Why? Well, some might think about it mechanically. It's got to be painful. But that's not the reason why it's painful. It's because of Eve. That's why it's painful. And I know at first hand, I've been with my wife every four times she's given birth to her children. She had very quick labours and the time real pains that I was an hour and a half for the four of them. Um, nurses never believe this. They're always throwing things onto the trolley all that, you know, all in a panic. But I found it horrendous uh, because of what I could see on her face and her clutching at my leaving big fingernail marks in my arm saying, help me. And was asked, would you like some gas? It's kind of me saying, yes, please. <laughs> so, um, I found it traumatic. Why did she suffer those pains? Not a mechanical issue. Because of the, the judgment that fell on her, passed on to her posterity. But both these judgments that fell on her, fell on her posterity. For every woman in a situation of authority, in the church or the home, the woman is to be, the, the man is to be the head of the woman. She is to submit to him. Childbirth is expelled because of Eve and those in settings where teaching is an expression of authority, women are forbidden to instruct men to lead them because of Eve and the church is one of those settings. So let's be clear. Women are not forbidden to teach men in the church because they are inherently spiritually and morally unstable or naturally naive. They are forbidden to do so because of a judgment upon women that will continue until this world is finally wound up and the curse is removed. You see, it's not an issue of, it's, it's an issue of God's judgment, not of a woman's capacity. Why is that important? I think it's very important because we live in a, an awful age where women are becoming very angry, wanting to assert themselves and in very dominant ways. And they, get very angry that churches don't allow them to teach. But sometimes the reason given why teach only further makes them angry is because, lady, you're naive. You're inherently spiritually and morally unstable. That's why you can't teach. We men, we are stable. I just don't see that in Scripture. The reason why she shouldn't teach is because of a past upon Eve that will last until Christ comes again. Let's be honest. If you don't believe Scripture as a woman, you will never submit to these restrictions because they're bound up in events the Bible records six, seven thousand years ago has happened, events that the world rejects people. But take to heart that Christ has given you great reasoning powers and renewed those reasoning powers. You're able to know Him and instruct concerning him. The reason why you're not to take a leading role in the church gathering has to do with your capacity, but with a judgment that fell upon Eve that also falls on all her offspring. Yet even when we do properly understand the reason for the restrictions, it's not necessarily easy to submit to sometimes, is it? Particularly if women see incompetence in the church. It gets hard then. 
Tithe you, I mean. Earnestly, that God would rise up men of good intellect, able to lay hold of the things of God and take up the role that God has given them. But consider the following, ladies. There are many outlets for women to guide and instruct. Women are from teaching 50% of the population because they're women. They're also able to teach more than 50%. They're able to teach children. They're not excluded from teaching children. Let me say, it is naturally undermined this role. But children are at a stage where they are the most soft, shapeable. There is no better time to instruct them and teach them and to form frameworks that will last for eternity in understanding. There will be many times when explaining is not an act of, exerting, of asserting authority over a man. A daughter may indeed guide her newly converted father in the things of God. As she sits down with him at the table and he says, Sweetheart, what, what, is, what does that mean? That's scripture. She's not to say, sorry, father, I must call a man. She has liberty. It's not an expression. It's merely an act of explaining. You know what, ladies? There are many men excluded from teaching as well for a variety of reasons. They are not suitable. You cannot become an elder, according to Paul, unless you are apt to teach. And some men are not. God has given them minds from reasoning, but not sufficient enough to take up that leading role. I think I'll leave it right there. Let's, um, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray for grace to live as though the Christ is on the very verge. We pray for grace to see him as the rightful king and authority, not only over all the world, but especially the church, especially us, his people. And may we just long for him to come. We pray until that time we would willingly, by your grace, submit to the various restrictions placed upon us, not fretting against them, but using what you have given us, the opportunities and abilities you have given us to do all we can to cause others to know him and love him and wait for him. So we ask that you would bless us with a remembrance of these things, with an excitement about these things. We ask that you would bless us for the rest of this day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.